Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Chrysalis Chapter 13, written by Beaverfur. As far as prisons went, Dalcat thought, he couldn't complain. His current uh, cell in the Imperium Palace easily outclassed his own apartment back in the council's embassy building. It was composed of four rooms, a bedroom with a terrace overlooking the gardens, a bathroom, a large office, and a meeting area that doubled as a small theater and a media room thanks to the bit projectors covering the entire wall. The palace might have been an ancient building, more than 400 years old, but that didn't mean that it was antiquated one. The Republic had made sure to see its government was always up to date, seamlessly weaving modern technology into the old-fashioned sumptuous architecture of the building. There was a formidable kitchen station that deployed from the kitchen walls, and the main bed had an anti-gravity comfort function. The hieroglyphs on the office room hid the present sensors, bid projectors, and auxiliary lights and audio speakers. Even the large, ornate seats could adjust to the shape of different body sizes, easily detecting and shifting to fit Dalcat's comparatively small and slender body frame. And yet, despite all this luxury, he was still a prisoner. He had been a prisoner for the last few days. The main door was locked, though with one guard or two guards always there. The terrace wasn't accessible, and the rooms themselves were apparently EM-shielded, preventing any kind of transmission from getting out. Thankfully, he wasn't completely isolated from the outer world. The vid projectors still had access to the public broadcasts, so even he was prevented from sending messages out, he could still follow the events of the development outside. Dowcat hadn't expected to get any reliable information out of the public broadcasts. After all, one of the key tenets of any coup was to quickly take control not only of the centers of executive power, but also the flow of information the public had access to. Taking over broadcast stations, shutting off data networks and vid transmissions. But that hadn't happened, the stations seemed to be remained independent, and the information in the broadcast still appeared genuine. From what Darkat was gathering, the only place that the coup had happened successfully to seize control was the Imperium Palace itself. He wondered what that meant. It could be that the coup was failed and had to take hold anywhere else, and devolved into mere hostage-taking situation at the palace. But if that were the case, the news station should be reporting fighting at those other locations too by now. If only in passing. But there was no mention of any attempts at taking over the other centers of power in Zinva. It was almost as if the coup leaders had forgotten about anything other than the Imperium Palace. Dalkant knew that it was always hard to reach valid conclusions when working under the severe limitations he was under. Nakstani had always remarked the critical importance of gathering good information. No matter how smart you were, if you worked out of erroneous intelligence, your assumptions would always turn out to be wrong. Despite that, he thought he knew enough by now to tentatively discard the idea of the Annex tribe plotting to take over the Republic's government, that this was some attempt at getting into power and replacing the Emperor. It just didn't fit. But uh, what other options could there be for this? He tried to put himself in the mind of the Anakax leaders, trying to think like they were thinking. Maybe they were playing the long game, where the major planet Anakix Varvan in disarray, the tribe was poised to lose a large part of their economical power over the next years. If the Zanvar Republic survived, that is. In that case, they might be trying to pull some sort of internal crisis that pitted the remaining tribes against each other. If all of the other tribes started fighting for control of the eroded government, that would buy Anakax some time to rebuild before anyone could take advantage of their weakened position but Dalcat doubted that they would go for such a dangerously suicidal strategy. It risked an internal civil war that would leave the entirety of the Republic, Anakax tribe concluded, even more exposed to an attack from the real enemy, the Terran, weaker than they already were. No, it wasn't that. There was no sense in defending against a potential future threat when an actual horrific one was right at your doorstep. Whatever this was about, he knew it must be related to the Terran. Dalcat shook his head, gazing out the window at the night sky. He couldn't see them, but he knew the troops were still out there. The coup participants had fortified inside the palace, and the soldiers of the other tribes still loyal to the Emperor and the Republic government were surrounding the building and hiding amongst the garden trees. No, this coup, he was sure of it, was going to fail eventually. It was meant to fail right from its very conception. 
So why was he attempting it in the first place? The smokescreen. A distraction, maybe, but what for? Or maybe not. Not a distraction, maybe he was forgetting about something. The Imperium Palace itself. During his time with Nakstani, Dalgat had started to see the palace mainly as a place of diplomacy and political intrigue, of official receptions, extravagant celebrations, and bitter, underhanded negotiations. But it was also much more than that. It was a seat of power and the interstellar nation, after all. There were entire wings of expansive building that he had never visited, and were off limits to any outsider. The residential parts of the palace, of course, but also those that contained the war rooms, government computer servers, transmitter arrays, quantum communicators. Could that be it? Not really a coup, but an assault on the Imperium Palace itself. It would have granted the Anakax tribe a short window of opportunity, a short time and frame which they could have had access to the palace's central computers and communication systems, in which they could have sent out any order under the pretense that it was coming from the trusted source right until the remaining high-ranking government officials gathered their wits about what was happening and cut the palace off of its government networks. A very, very short time in which the Anakax tribe would have unopposed control over the Republic's remaining military forces and communication channels. But to do what? What exactly? Whatever orders they could have given would have been in retracted soon enough by the rest of the surviving government. Except, of course, that some things couldn't be so easily retracted. If a warship had gone into warp as a result of a malicious order, it might take days before it returned to normal space and contact could be re-established again. At any rate, Darkhead knew that he wasn't in direct danger. Whatever the true intent of the coup attempt was, he would be respected. No tribe would risk making an enemy of the Galactic Council by hurting one of the ambassadors. No, his forced reclusion was simply a way of keeping him from interfering. Not that it made any less awful. A comfortable as Yusel was, he couldn't help but feel bored beyond belief. Boredom. It was a state of mind Dark had a little experience with. Ever since he started his career in the Council's diplomatic corps, there had always been something to do, something to work at. Be it the upcoming examination, messages to write, reports to read, never enough time to get bored. Even those periods in warp time was measured subjectively in minutes and hours at most, rather than days. He connected the bit projector again. Though his eyes glazed over the three-dimensional images, it was something he had seen before, the reconstruction of the Battle of Anakax Warven, the maneuvers and counter-maneuvers of the Council fleet and the Terran swarm. The narrator's upbeat voice was trying to put an optimistic tone to it, remarking at how the Council's EM distortion field had managed to disrupt the Terran's attack plan and cause it to lose an entire swarm. Little mention was made at how the Council itself had also lost an entire fleet. He was starting to fall asleep when the image suddenly changed and a large tech with bold glyphs flashed out along with the piercing noise. He augmented irises kicked in, translating the text on the fly. Alert! Immediate evacuation order. Hostile fleet approaching Zinva. Evacuate your local refuges now. Follow orders from tribal authorities. Expect use of nuclear weapons. Expect radioactive fallout. Dalkat jumped up from his seat, his heart beating faster. He blinked hard, almost thinking his irises were malfunctioning. But the text didn't change. He stood frozen for a few seconds, considering his options. Not that he had many trapped in here. Could he try and break the window and descend to the outer wall? Even if he could actually make a dent in the reinforced glass, he doubted that he would make it due to the ground without falling. He couldn't help but smirk at the irony of it all, at having escaped the colony world of Yovit just to be arrived right in time for the destruction of Zinva. In the end, he didn't even have to make the choice. The main door to his suite opened up and three Zinvarian soldiers entered, carrying weapons and wearing the Anakax tribe's color stripes. You! shouted one of the lead. We leave, you come. Dalgat nodded and followed the group out the door and into the long corridor with short seatings and wooden floors. The leading soldier put a large hand on his shoulder, unnecessarily forcing him to walk at a fast pace. At least they weren't pointing their weapons at him. Dalgat didn't know if he should feel glad for that, or slightly insulted that they didn't even consider him a threat at all. The palace had plunged into a frenzy of activity. There were squads of soldiers running along the corridors, dodging the crates and boxes scattering all over the place. Groups of captive staff workers were evacuating, escorted by the Anakax troops. Here and there, someone shouted orders that were ignored. 
The palace workers, more scared by the ominous message than bid projectors by those that had taken them hostage. How much time do we have? Dalk had asked at the leading soldier, his little squad. Zimdvarian looked down at him as if debating whether to answer or not, or maybe he hadn't understood the question. It didn't look as if he had been very firm grasp on the council's interlanguage. When will warp tunnel collapse? Dalk had asked instead. At that, the soldier reacted. None, he said, already here. Dalk had blinked. No warning time at all, but uh, that's not possible. The soldier's mouth tentacles raised slightly, but he didn't have anything else to say, instead forcing the squad to rush ahead of another group of civilians that were converging into the same corridor. It was impossible, Dark had knew. The warp tunnel would have been detected hours before its collapse, just like in Yovit. Either the remaining Zinvarian authorities or the rear guard fleet council had an orbit around the capital planet. The only way they could have missed the approaching Terran in warp was if they requested a valid flight plan ahead of time. The image of the murderous machine filing out the digital paperwork and submitting a flight plan for its attack for approval was ludicrous and almost made Dalcat burst into laughter then and there. Except that, of course, someone else could have submitted the flight plan, inserted it directly into the database. Say, someone with direct access to the Republic's military computers, with the authority of the Imperium Palace, the seat of the government itself. The thought didn't feel that funny anymore. His group descended a long flight of stairs and entered a different corridor, the one Dark had recognized, with its marble columns and ornate walls. It was one of the major wide corridors crossing the entire palace north to south and linking the different wings together. They turned left and started walking in the same direction most of the others and variants were moving to evacuate. When they crossed the stationary group in high-ranking military officers' apparel, Daokat's irises activated and an icon flashed at the top of one of the Zinvarians with his name and basic information, someone Daokat had met before, and that he had judged important enough to add a facial recognition function of his irises. He read the displayed text. Darakar, the Anakax tribe, tribe leader. He remembered the Zinvarian now. Daokat had met him during the visit to Anakax Warven some time ago along with Nakstani, He was the one of the leaders of the tribe, though he was in charge of the business operations rather than political contacts. Daokat had never seen him in the Imperium Palace before, let alone dressed in a military outfit, apparently leading a coup. Not that the military garments fit him well, though. The Zunvarian lacked the confidence then projected self-assurance common amongst the generals and fleet admirals that Daokat was used to seeing. It was apparent that he was a businessman playing as a soldier. Darkat waited until they passed right in the stationary group and then stopped suddenly. The soldiers escorting him tried to force him to resume walking, but he turned to face the tribe leader. Daraka, he shouted. The Anakax leader turned to face him, surprised. Then he made some sort of hand gesture directed at the soldiers who visibly relaxed. Ah, yes, a new ambassador. His voice was smooth and precise, probably as a result of many years of practicing the council's language, Darkat thought. My apologies, I don't recall your name, but there will be time to get acquainted again once we have both evacuated the planet. Also, I hope you can understand why the need of having you lodged in the guests. Betraying your people, Dalcat interrupted, his voice roar and almost shouting, Betraying the council for the Terran. Why? Darakar's mouth tentacles trembled slightly, then his head bobbed. I see. Nakstani was always astute. I shouldn't have expected any less from her successor. You gave it an opening, didn't you? You sneaked a false flight plan into that Terran could blindside the defending forces. The Zinvarian stood silent for a long few seconds before replying. Yes, he said at last, we did. We also ordered half of the defending forces around the planet to warp away under false pretenses. We also sent the Terran all the confidential records of the Emperor's possession regarding the destruction of its species, as well as the codes of the planetary defense stations and the locations of the remaining fleets in both the Council and the Zimbarian Republic. Talcat was speechless, the treason, the extent of the betrayal and its consequences, with their focus on civil liberties and economical freedoms, the Anakax tribe had originally been one of the major forces behind the Empire's transformation into a Republic and one of the Council's natural allies in the political reform program. This, this was unexpected. Just, uh, why? This is suicidal, Dalcat asked. Not so much, the Zimvarian paused as if remembering something. Hmm, you've been told the story of the Bone Titans, yes? 
This is not a time for a lesson of myths and legends, Derekar. I am afraid, if you are correct once more, so I'll make haste. In the story, the town of Nectar was attacked by a great lumbering creature made of bone. The titans were invincible, impervious to both lance and arrow. The town's leaders were desperate. They tried facing complete annihilation at the hands of a monster. Until one of them, Derekar, please. Yes, yes. To make a long story short, they figured what the titans wanted. Bones, fresh ones. So, the oldest of the town elders decided to sacrifice himself. His fresh bones were put into a ditch in the entrance of the town, and it worked. The next time the titans returned, they didn't destroy any houses or farms. They just scooped up the bones and left the way they came. So they kept the tradition, and every five years, the oldest member of the town would be sacrificed. No more again had the town of Nekat worry about the monsters. Darkhat nodded in understanding. You're talking about appeasement. Indeed, the Terran seeks justice, yes, or vengeance, as your Grand Minister aptly noted in his conversation with the machine. So we decided to deliver what it wants. We gave it the information, the location of the Emperor and the seat of government, then the names of the tribes that were involved in the genocide and the subsequent cover-up. You can't be serious. The Terran's concept of justice involves the complete extermination of the Zimba Republic. Ah... But you are not talking about a tribe leader of the Zimba's Republic anymore, my dear friend. I am Minister Derricka of the newly formed nation of Anakax, a new market democracy that has just declared its independence from the Zimba Republic. Derricka shook his head. That is, um, the Terran won't care about that. The Terran will understand that we are on its side, Derricka said, his voice shaking. It'll understand that the Anakax tribe always was against the militaristic expansion of the Empire and that our people always were underdogs, always fighting for freedoms and justice, a pitted enemy for those who destroyed its own species. If anything, we fought our best to prevent tragedies like that, even if we didn't always succeed. Dalcat sighed, much as he didn't want to admit it, the Anakax tribe's plan might actually work. His own experience with the Terran led him to believe that the Replicator had a very binary worldview. Either it tried to kill you, or it would go out of its way to save you, like it had done for Darkat himself and his pals here. So, if the Anakax tribe managed to get into the Terran's good side, maybe by way of triggering its reprocity, then their good chances of surviving this whole thing is unscathed. Better chances than even the Council itself, Darkat reflected. But it was still wrong. You're scared, he said. I know, I'm scared of what another attack of the Anakax Farben might do, but this, this is wrong, Darakar. Even if you survive, you'll be doing so at the cost of hundreds of millions of innocent lives. And how many innocent lives are there in Anakax Farben, Ambassador? What would you expect us to do, he shouted. You can't afford a self-righteous, yes, because it is not your world that is targeted for destruction. It is not your friends that will die. Not your tribe, your... He paused, searching for the word family. We don't have the luxury of your elevated morals anymore. So we must look at our people and look out for them, for our own tribe first. Dalcat nodded, defeated. It was wrong. It was clearly wrong, and even the tribe leader in front of him knew that it was wrong. If his shaking voice was any indication that it was a form of cowardice. But what could he expect? In light of a widespread destruction and the inevitable genocide, he couldn't understand the logic, the calculations. After all, wasn't it better for at least some part of the Zimbarian species to survive? Or was survival not worth it? If saving yourself required you to push others into the path of destruction, it meant that you had to turn into a monster. Hard to say. His own people had never had to face such a dilemma, and he'd hoped the day would find some way to stop the Terran before that came to be, or negotiate a ceasefire somehow, which reminded him of a conversation the Grand Minister had with the machine right before the Battle of the Industrial Planet. When reviewing the transcriptions, he couldn't help but notice how harsh the cold and the Zakarin had been. Dalcat had been trying to figure out how he would have approached the Terran instead. Let me talk to it, Dalcat blurted out. What? Give me a communication channel to the Terran, whatever you used to send us information before. I think, I believe, I can reason with it. Ambassador, there is no time for that. Besides, it has already been tried. No, he said, not properly, not by me. I had contact with this machine back in Yovit. Maybe it'll still remember me. Darakar looked conflicted. Ambassador, this place will be destroyed. Perhaps this entire planet. We can't remain here. 
Dark Hat clenched his fists. I'm not asking you to stay. You can leave. Just give me the channel first. I won't be leaving any of my subordinates here either. If you stay, you'll do so on your own, with no way to evacuate. Dark Hat paused for a second. Suddenly, this decision had become serious, important in a way no other decision that he had ever made was. He felt tempted to follow the Zunvarian's recommendation to evacuate the planet, to abandon the idea, or maybe talk to the Terran from a relative safety of a spaceship. Except that putting himself in danger was part of his plan. It had to be. The idea was simple. The Terran had saved him once, so it might save him twice. The hope was that if the Terran knew the Daokan was down here, it would refrain from the indiscriminate attack against this planet. That it would be forced to examine the nature of its morality, putting the thirst of justice against the little core of empathy that Daokan hoped still existed. Or maybe it wouldn't work, and he would be disintegrated along with the palace itself. But still... If there was even the slightest chance that he could save millions of innocent Zinvarian lives. Dalkat closed his eyes, uncertain. He thought of Nuxtani, of what would she have done in his place. But of course, he knew exactly what her opinion would have been. This was the frontier after all. He gave the Anakax tribe leader a curt nod, more to reassure himself than anything else. I know what I'm doing, Darakar. You and your people can leave, but open the channel for me first, please. Darakar gave him a nod, an actual nod, which looked out of place on the Zimbarian's heavy head. Very well. I hope your council won't blame us for your last yes. Before Darkat could reply, Darakat had already turned to give instructions to the soldiers escorting him in their own language. The soldiers didn't look happy, but he acknowledged the orders and started walking towards the side corridor, motioning for Darkat to follow. He did, not bothering to say goodbye to the Anakak's leader. As soon as they got to the main corridor, the soldiers started running, and Dalkat struggled to follow. They passed empty offices and heavily decorated rooms, the soldier stopping from time to time to unlock electronic safety latches for the doors, then waiting just enough for Dalkat to pass through before taking the lead again. Every minute felt eternal, as if fire would start raining out of the sky at any moment. Dalkat felt guilty for putting the soldier in this dire situation, risking being left behind by his comrades if they took too long. So, he pushed himself to run harder and faster. They raced along the marbled corridors, their steps against the smooth floors echoing in the recently vacated rooms that they crossed. Darkat wondered if the two of them would be the only ones left inside the sprawling Imperium Palace, if everyone else but them evacuated already. Maybe the Emperor was here too, locked inside a room waiting to be destroyed by the Terran like some sort of twisted blood sacrifice for a vengeful god. He pushed those thoughts aside as they entered the large war room, its round walls covered in vid projectors showing an orbital view of the battle going reaching outside. Apparently, the Terran had already engaged the meager defense force, and its main enormous ship was pushing its way through the positions. The planetary defensive stations were nowhere to be found. The soldier activated the console, pushing the large chair out of the way. They waited for the screen loaded. Then he pointed at the tactile icon. Press and talk, he said. Dalkat was about to say something, but the soldier had already turned on his feet and was running towards the door. Um, thanks, Dalkat sat in the now empty room. He focused on the icon, wondering what to say, how to approach it, what his first words would be. Dalkat noticed his hands were trembling. He realized then that they had been a very stupid idea a potentially lethal one. Every time he had tried addressing the Terrence machines back at Yobit, they had remained silent. It had ignored his pleas, comments, and harsh remarks. Why would it be any different now? That worst that Dalkat knew was that he would feel incredibly stupid if the Terran didn't reply, and it turned out that he had uselessly wasted his life for such a pointless task. He closed his eyes, trying to relax his muscles. He noticed that he was still gasping for air from the run, he had to be optimistic, though. But still, how to approach it? He tried to let the fears and review what he knew, like he had done back at the dinner reception. So long ago. Try and see what he missed before. With the eyes closed, he could almost imagine Nuxtani sitting next to him, looking at him. He could picture her predatory smirk. Tell me, kid, how did the Zakarin frick up? He thought that he was in position of superiority, Dark had said in the empty room, that their military display would act as a deterrent. The council, having a countermeasure, only reinforced that belief. 
Hmm, that's true, but that wasn't why he failed, was it? Darkat reflected since the Terran had let them escape and destroy the colony world. Darkat had suspected that there was some sort of latent sentience inside the machine, some traces of empathy. No, Darkat said, he failed to engage the Terran on an empathic level. He treated it as an enemy from the start. What should you do then? Ah. Darkat opened his eyes and pressed the console's icon, and the light next to it changed color to blue and a text message appeared indicating a language cipher was connected. He paused for a second, clearing his head of any doubt, of any worry. Then he took a deep breath. Hi, he said. My name is Darkat. We've met before in Yobit, the first colony world you attacked. I was one of the survivors that crashed the spaceship, the one you rescued. He paused, but no reply came. He felt a growing worry. I, uh, I just wanted to thank you for saving my life, you know. Mine and Talriza's. And I thought that maybe, then maybe you might want to talk. Just that, talk, no strings attached. He waited for a few seconds. Still no reply. Dalcat shook his head. This had been a very, very stupid mistake. But it was too late to run away now. He had lost that chance already. So, with nothing else to do, he kept talking. I mean, I'm not sure if you remember me. You made me us a replacement spaceship and... Uh, Darkat had listened to the recordings of the voice the Terran had used to talk to the council before. A synthetic voice, yes, but one that still sounded natural. That one that came through the speakers interrupting him. It was different, still recognizable, but it had definitely changed. Now it sounded distorted and flat, lacking any intonation. It sounded mechanical, like rusted gears scraping against each other. It was a voice of a nightmare, of an emotionless terror the voice of one of those bone titans that the tribe leader had mentioned before. A voice that sent a cold shiver running down Dalkat's spine. Yes, the monster said, I remember you. End of chapter. Chrysalis Chapter 14, written by Bieberfur. Once again, I went over the information contained in the package that I had received. Names, dates, coordinates... Admiral can after the second surge, the Imperian decree, the exact amount of money the destruction of Earth had saved the Guxnak tribe, the Emperor's name, locations of future patrol routes of every fleet in the Galactic Council still had an Orion arm. I had already sent orders to the rest of my army to move to intercept these once they were finished their current assignments. They would be easier to defeat if I caught them unaware and in transit before they had time to group together. The exact coordinates of the Imperium Palace. An opening, a time and place that I could warp to undetected. Right here, right now. And then, and only at the end, a request, a plea, a small one, given everything the benefactors have given me in return, that I left the Anakak's tribe, or nation, as they were calling themselves now, intact. That I allowed them to live. A plea. I didn't intend to pay any heed to, of course. Back when I was going over the ruins of the first colony world I attacked, I had already realized that Zenova Republic was segregated, its population split into different cultural factions. I had briefly considered the idea of taking advantage of that by pitting these factions against each other, though I hadn't really committed to that plan. But it looked like I had managed to do exactly that, even if unaware. The huge pressure I put on the Zenova under the exasperated their differences, turning the thin fissures of their society into massive fractures. And now, one of the tribes had decided the best way to save their own skin was to throw the former comrades under the bus, so to speak. They were idiots. If they thought that they could escape my retribution simply by bribing me, but whatever the reasons were, they had given me an opening, an advantage I intended to press, which was why I was currently approaching the capital planet of Zunver Republic, along with two support ships and a couple hundred thousand drones. It was a small army, I knew, but with the advantage of having surprise factor granted to me, plus the codes and information in my power, I had considered it a large enough to make good work of the meager defending forces. The other reason, of course, was that I didn't want to overcommit in case the whole thing turned out to be an ambush of some kind. Granted, losing my army would be an inconvenience, but not a terrible loss in the grand scheme of things. It didn't look like there was an ambush, though. Just as my benefactors had promised, the defending forces had been caught unprepared to my arrival. Not that there was much of a defending force, at any rate. 
less than half the dozen Zenvarian vessels plus an equal number of warships with a wild assortment of varied appearances I had learnt to associate with the council's military. There was just a reacting to my presence, trying to group together in some semblance of an organized battle formation, positioning themselves between my army and the large blue and white planet. Zinva was large, much larger than the industrial world at last attack, larger than Earth even, but the extent of the habitable landmass was surprisingly scarce once compared to the sheer size of the planet with most of the population apparently living in the main supercontinent, but four times the size of Asia. And except for a few archipelagos, the rest of the planet's surface was entirely covered by water. It was, I thought, a very definition of a blue planet. My bare feet setting in the wet sand, soft, foamy waves lopping at them, the slight tug whenever the water receded, the blue, white sky and the sea fused together, the lines separating them impossible to discern. Floating around the world, I could detect eight planetary defense stations the Anakax tribe's messages had warned me about. Eight shielded white spheres orbiting Xenovers like a small artificial moons, each one carrying a powerful laser projector. The four of them that had me in sight were slowly rotating to face my main body. After surviving the devastating attacks of the Council's starfish battleship and its energy weapon, I couldn't say that the sight of a defensive station didn't scare me. I knew that I wouldn't have much of a problem sustaining whatever damage they could unleash against me while the rest of my army dealt with them. But I didn't have to. I engaged my radio transmitters at the exact frequency the Anakax tribe had instructed me to, and sent a sequence of numeric codes. Once they identified me and my army as friendly fleet, the eyes and automated planetary defensive station sensors, Immediately, they stopped their rotation and started retracting their laser projectors and returning to the standby positions. I felt a sense of vicious triumph, that I was sure to broadcast the rest of the sentient minds in my current army. As usual, they didn't reply. My offspring often talked to each other, but never directly to me unless I ordered them to do so. I guessed I should have felt bad about that, but there was no guilt, no annoyance, just the same stillness I experienced when killing the Zeverian survivors, when burning their worlds. The same emptiness. At some point in the past, the stillness had bothered me, but now, even that annoyance was going away, the sense of that there was something deeply wrong slowly receding. Because there wasn't. I was winning, and it didn't worry me. I didn't think I was even capable of it anymore, in fact, and I preferred it that way. It offered a relief, but it also meant less than second-guessing, less time wasted going over my feelings. It made it easier for me to do what I knew I had to do. The defense stations were temporarily disabled, but I knew the situation wouldn't last. The Zinvarian officers would be working hard right now to revoke the Allied status forged identity code had granted my forces. But it didn't have to last for long, just a few minutes that it would take my army to destroy the stations while they were defenseless. I sent the order, and half my squads and drones accelerated hard, moving forwards to engage the different spherical stations. The rest of them and my support ships advanced towards the enemy vessels instead, which were already opening fire upon us. Apparently, the warship's commanding officers were not as easily fooled by the sensors of the automated defense platforms. Nothing that could present a menace to my forces, at any rate. The enemy energy beams were scattered and uncoordinated, a reflection of how unprepared they were about the sudden appearance. It only took a couple minutes for my drones to surround the vessels, spiraling around them and burning their surfaces with the hundreds of simultaneous energy weapons, while my robotic assault spiders crawled into the council ships. I refrained from using nuclear warheads this time. I already had the upper hand, so I opted instead for trying my best at capturing some of the council ships in order to reverse engineer the more advanced technologies they had. My drones weren't so considerate towards the defensive stations, though. A flash of nuclear light marked the end of a mass of orbital weapons, quickly followed by three similar detonations on the locations of its counterparts. Then, the drones pulled back on their own, reorganizing themselves and moving in to attack the remaining station on the opposite side of the planet. It was strange to observe how my army worked on its own, to see how the sentient drones talked to each other, how they coordinated their movements and approach vectors, how they gave each other the clear before detonating any warhead, so that no intelligent machine was caught in the blast by mistake. 
I had me feel utterly redundant. I had relegated myself to the role of an overseer, simply setting the tone of the overflow of the battle. Like some sort of orchestra conductor telling my army to perform movements that we had already trained, but with very limited input to their actual execution. Which was the point, of course. The council managed to block my transmissions right now. Nothing of substance would really change. I had to remind myself that this was the exception rather than the rule, though. It wasn't common for fights to be so smooth, to always go the way that you'd previously planned. The only reason we were winning unopposed here was because of the advantage the Anakak's tribe had given to us. So, I knew that my role would become critical again once we had to fight more balanced battles in the future against the remaining council forces. But, for the time being, I could relax and watch how my army dealt with the enemy on their own. I took notes, evaluating the effectiveness of their formations and maneuvers and trying to find weaknesses in their fighting style that a more organized opposing force might be able to exploit. The information I gathered here would become useful when training the next generation of virtual minds still in the nursery. So far, my main body had remained away at a safe rear guard, out of range of the fight itself while I waited for the rest of my forces to clear a path. But now that I was close to being done, I started a second part of my plan. My repaired thrusters engaging simultaneously accelerating the enormous mass of the 27km ship. I had been unsure of what to do regarding my damaged body. Well, I could have easily repaired and upgraded it. The resources involved in doing that could be better invested into constructing four entirely new support ships instead which better shield and energy weapons technology than I had installed on my main body. Even the factories contained in it were unnecessary, falling short of the second generation assembly lines that I had been building on Tau Ceti, an orbital habitat. Simply put, my body was obsolete, and now that I had started thinking of it as a tool rather than a body, I was realizing how unwieldy it was. Unlike having four or five support ships, a single large vessel couldn't be spread into different armies if I didn't want to distribute my strength across several systems at the same time. It lacked versatility, forcing me to commit into certain types of strategy over others. And even then, it didn't offer much more than a big target for the enemy beams, given that my main offensive weapon was my army of drones, and not any sort of device that I carried on a large ship. If I was honest with myself, the reason I had been using it so much was because of a stupid idea of identifying myself as a body, rather than as a ship. The tool, it actually was. Useless nostalgia once again. Even now the large vessel had been my body in the past, it didn't have us remained its own in the future. I now had to change my body with the same ease I could change clothes in my previous life. I could simply transfer my mind state into one of the support ships, or I could even exist in some sort of disembodied consciousness, running on servers at any of my many outposts and directing my armies from afar. Now that I didn't have a micromanage of the entirety of the swarm, the bandwidth and latency problems of the quantum links weren't that significant. Unabashedly embracing the new digital nature came with a load of privileges. Not only could I be immortal and incorporeal, but I wouldn't need to subject the tyranny of warp travel again. I could simply send an army on its way, transfer my mind via quantum link directly into the ships once it reached the destination, entirely bypassing the time I'd have to spend disconnected while traveling with them. No, it won't be us. I cursed myself for my fear, my misguided reluctance and acceptance of advantages of the new form granted to me. I remembered seeing it as some soft, slippery slope, but I had been wrong. I was still myself, just um, a better, more optimal and effective myself. I discarding this main body, the 27-kilometer relic that was part of that, a way of shedding change, a definitely breaking the last ties that still existed with this part of me that had been holding me back. That would have my return to my former nature rather than move forward. And what better way to discard that body, I thought, as I redirected all the energy output by its power plants into the repaired thrusters, than to have a crash at full speed into Zunvar's Imperium Palace. What better way than to transform it into some sort of vengeful technological asteroid? What better way than to provoke an extinction-level event, one that cleansed the planet of the plague of that had taken root there? That was why I had remained away from the battle after all, so that I could have more distance, more time to accelerate even further. That was why the only part of my body I'd actually repaired and upgraded had been the thrusters. So, 
I accelerated, carefully plotting my trajectory so that I would fall right on top of the palace. It found right somehow to strike directly at the heart of the empire that had destroyed Earth. Poetic, in a sense. Still, no matter how maddening my current speed was and how fast it was increasing with every passing second, I knew I wouldn't match the impossible speeds of the actual asteroid. Luckily, I didn't have to. I was big, very big, and quick simulation told me that my current momentum was enough to vaporize a large portion of the Zinver's crust, sending enormous amounts of rock and debris out of the planet's atmosphere and into suborbital trajectories. The capital city would instantaneously disintegrate under the resulting shockwave from the impact, and the ejected debris would rain back down all over the planet and cause the atmosphere to heat due to the new hits. There would be firestorms and continental scale, and a layer of dust and ash that would cover the entire world, killing off all plant life in a few weeks or months due to lack of sunlight. Whatever more advanced life survived the initial impact would also perish soon after that. All things considered, it sounded like an effective plan. I pushed my thrusters even harder, just as I zipped by the front lines, quickly leaving my army of drones behind as I fell towards the planet. A few virtual alarms blared in my head, forcing the thrusters to work of intensity for a long was permanently damaging them, but given that I intended to do with the ship I was piloting, that wasn't really a concern, so I simply ignored them. I noticed a few Zinverian vessels were leaving the planet's atmosphere. A quick check of the identification codes who were sending towards me told me that they were part of the Anakax tribe, who were evacuating the palace just as they had told me in their former communication. This had been part of their plea. They said that they wouldn't be able to leave the palace until my arrival sent the forces as loyal to the Republic in disarray, giving them the opening to escape. They had asked me to not attack the evacuation ships, to simply turn a blind eye and allow them to warp away. I considered ordering my army to take them down anyways. I didn't intend to respect this tribe, so it wasn't like I had to follow their instructions. But in the end, I refrained myself. Not because I planned to spare them, but because I doubted destroying these ships would do much damage to the Anakax tribe. No, I would be in my interest to have them believe that I was being respect to their terms, but that way they would be relaxed and feel safe, which meant that I would have the surprise factor on my side when I finally turned around to exterminate them. If I attacked now, I'd be tipping my hand. So I remained in a silence and watched the evacuation ships escape the planet's atmosphere and... Uh, one by one, engaging the warp drives and jumped out of our star system, probably heading back to the industrial world. I put them out of my mind and focused again on my trajectory, making slight corrections to compensate for the effects of the faint upper atmosphere layer that I was starting to pierce. Then there was a new transmission interrupting my thoughts. Hi, my name is Dalkat. We've met before in Yobit, the first colony world you attacked. I was one of the one of the survivors that crashed in the spaceship, the one you rescued. It was coming through the same redundant way the Anakax tribe had tried to send me the information package containing their plans. Did that mean that this alien creature I had saved was related to that? Had he influenced the tribe somehow to encourage their betrayal? I, uh, I just wanted to thank you for saving my life, you know, mine and Talhizra's. The end I thought that maybe that you might want to talk. Just that, talk, no strings attached. I didn't, not really. I remembered feeling the need to communicate back when I'd originally woken up, and now the idea of not ever having another human to talk to had been unbearable at first. But now, now I had other humans, sort of, the virtual minds that I created, except that they didn't want to talk to me, which wasn't surprising, not after what I'd done to their brains, the shackles that I had added to their code. What was surprising was how it didn't really affect me. It didn't mind that they didn't want to talk to me, that they apparently hated me. I knew that there was something off about that, but um, I didn't find it in me to be concerned by it. Not anymore. Those worries, that self-doubt that I had cast away in that moment, I had decided to accept my new nature, to embrace my immortality. And yet, I sort of wanted to reply. A small part of me felt some mild interest at what the creature would have to say, some curiosity as to what role, it, if any, it had played in the Anakax tribe's defection. I mean, uh, the editing continued, unabated. I'm not sure if you remember me. You made us a replacement spaceship and, um... Yes, I replied. I remember you. 
Just like that only time I'd spoken before to the council, those words were also met with silence that stretched out for long seconds, as if he could not believe that I would agree to speak, as if it was an impossibility. I didn't really understand him, he was the one addressing me, so why act so surprised when I decided to respond? When he did respond, it wasn't with something that I would have expected. Why? I waited, in case he wanted to clarify the question, but he didn't. Why what? I asked. Why saving us? You didn't have to, but you rescued us, gave us medicine, gave us a way to escape. So I want to know. Why? Because it was fair, I said, just like I told the Galactic Council. You were not my enemies. But still, you didn't have to go to the lengths you went to, so I wonder, was that all it was? Wasn't there any reason other than fairness? I focused on these words, trying to remember... It felt murky. The ruined planet, the corpses, the two creatures, they were hurt, bleeding, and I had... What? I had taken a decision, hadn't I? An olive branch, I said without thinking, my response almost instinctive. What is that? he asked. An attempt at coexistence, I clarified, trying to remember what my thoughts had been at the time. I'd hoped that by saving you both, we could establish some sort of peace, one that the council shot down. That, um... It was a mistake on our part, the alien said, but you need to understand the council didn't know what happened to your species, and they were afraid of you. But we can do better now that we know. There is still room for peace. I work for the council, and we can negotiate a ceasefire. This is why I've come here to Zinva, but you need to stop. If you destroy the planet, if you kill me, you'll be burning the olive branch of yours. I frowned internally. The attempt at manipulation was obvious. It shouldn't have worked, and yet some part of me, something, at the idea of killing the creature, it wouldn't stop me from doing what I needed to do. Not really, but I knew I wasn't going to enjoy my victory here. It felt tainted now, somehow. That's unfortunate, I said, but hardly my responsibility. You weren't supposed to come to this planet, and yet you did despite knowing that what my intentions were. He let out a sigh. Yes, I did come here, because I wanted to know the truth, because I wanted to hear about the destruction of your world right from the Emperor's mouth. I felt curious about that. And did this Emperor admit it? He did, and I agree with you. What happened to your people was horrible, despicable. It, it demands justice. Then you understand why I must destroy the Zanbar Republic. But it happened almost 300 years ago, the alien Darkhat said, raising his voice. The empire that did it is just gone. Zanva changed the abandoned their militaristic ideals. The people alive today, those in this planet, they aren't responsible. They didn't choose to be born to the descendants of those who murdered your... But they are, I shouted. I've seen their factories, I've seen their colonies, their resource extraction outposts, all their wealth, their power, their comfort. It comes at the cost of species like mine. This republic of theirs was erected on top of the ruins of my world. Which is why there should be reparations. Why? I interrupted him. His words about reparations and sanctions reminded me of what the talk with the council. It sounded nice, but I knew that it was all that. Just words. Empty words. At the end of the day. Reparations can't suffice. The Zimverians murder my people, so it's only fair I do the same to them. He paused for a few seconds before responding. I noticed my surface temperature was rising as I submerged deeper into the planet's atmosphere. I wonder, does it help? He said at last, calling them the Zimverians, treating them as a uniform group, as if they are all the same. They all think alike, ignoring that they are individuals, each of them with their own beliefs aspirations and dreams that none of the people that you've killed had anything to do with the decision to destroy your world that most of them didn't even know about it doesn't make it easier storming out of the room slamming the door in my wake walking through the empty corridors and offices fists clenched i felt a surge of indignation anger i almost cut the communication right there and then but i didn't for some reason, I wanted him to understand, even if he didn't approve of my actions. Refusing to talk, retreating into myself, felt awfully close to admitting that he was right. And he couldn't be right, because the consequences, he was, um... There was no such distinction when humanity was wiped out, I said. They massacred us. Why should I be any different now? It's, uh, a kind of balance, returning them to the exact thing that they gave to us. The same pain. But you can't return it to them. Because the ones responsible are already dead. 
Admiral Kanafta, the former leader of the Garrison tribe, the emperor at the time, they're all gone. It's history. You can't simply blame the children for what the ancestors did. You aren't returning what is due by creating a new pain and feeding a never-ending cycle of violence. What sort of justice is that? The only kind of justice that can still be had, the only one that remains, they robbed us of our future, so I'll... They robbed you of your future, Dalgat said, incredulous, and yet here I am, talking to a Terran in a Terran language. Doesn't that mean that Admiral Karafta didn't succeed, that some part of your people managed to survive? Through you. You still have a future. We can help you rebuild. If there are biological remains still left in your world, some of the Council Nations might be able to reconstruct your species off of them. And even if that fails, you still exist. You can still carry the legacy of your people. I paused. I considered the idea of reconstruction, of course. And in a sense, the virtual minds I created might have been a step in that direction. But uh, I wasn't ready for that. Not yet. That was an option only one wanted to consider once my retribution was complete. I see. So you want me just to let bygones be bygones then, I said. No. But I want you to let history be history. To let the remains of the past be where it belongs and focus on the future. The past? It's not some distant past long forgotten. I was there. I was there when the bombs vaporized our cities. I lost my friends. My family... The sounds of the TV on an endless drone, the senseless list of names, cities, places washed over me, frozen, paralyzed. A single name, a single place stuck in my mind. And I get it, I really do, he said. You are grieving, you are hurt, and this revenge, this retribution, it matters to you. Maybe it's the thing that matters the most, because it's the only thing you have left, isn't it? The thing that keeps you going day after day. Maybe, maybe this is something that you are doing for yourself, not because of your people, because you need it. I wanted to discard his words. I really did, but I feared that there could be a grain of truth in them. I thought myself indebted to the ones who had died, bound to their promise, responsibility to them. But uh, was that true? I remembered that back when I had first awoken, I considered ending it all, shutting down my processing units. Had I been searching for a purpose then, something that could keep me going, that gave me the reason to not simply pull the plug. You could honor them instead, the alien said. That's what I'm doing, I replied with an absent voice, still considering his earlier words. No, you're avenging them. There's a difference. If you keep this up, your species will only be remembered as a nightmare, a horror that we'll be glad when it's dead. But I refuse to think that your people were only capable of destruction and genocide. I'm sure that there was more to it than that. Curiosity, ambition, empathy, creativity. There had to be, or you could honor those, be a light instead of a shadow, Terran. Terran, that word again. Don't call me Terran, I said. I'm a human, a silence. But are you a human, he asked. An important thought, one I had to remember, one I had forgotten. I froze. Cold noise, a metallic maw devouring me, its teeth made of drones, thousands, millions of them spinning, spiraling around me, utterly alien, utterly inhuman, burning my flesh with their lasers. I knew the answer to that, didn't I? The night sky, full of stars, all of them evil. It was the place where monsters lived. Monsters, nightmares, and mechanical horrors. I knew the answer to that question. The place where I lived. No, I said at last, though I wasn't sure if I was replying to his question, or if it was an outward expression of my realization. Maybe both. The alien. No. Darkat was saying something, but the words didn't register. I had long suspected that fighting monsters was turning me into one, and the boundaries were important, that there was a slippery slope, and that it would only take one misstep, that there was some profound incompatibility, that I couldn't have both the revenge I wanted while also remaining intact, human, that I couldn't go to the lengths that I had while also remaining myself at the same time. One thing had to give, and it had. I felt once more all those muted emotions that had gone missing, leaving an empty stillness behind. They all rushed back as if to compensate for the lost time. A deep fear, a crushing guilt, a mounting anger. 
the hilarity of the irony of it all. They took turns emoting fighting each other, stepping on each other in escalation of intensity without respite of my body. And it was my body, of course it was. Wrapped up in a blanket of flames, I felt an overwhelming sadness, a sense of loss so strong that it made me want to scream and cry. But of course, monsters couldn't cry, a realization that sent my mind into a fit of maddening laughter. Was this what being insane felt like? Could I maybe make a therapist? I laughed harder. I could feel the gaze of my sentient drones. No, slaves. They were slaves. Their gaze burned me. They were just judging me, of course, making silent demands, wanting back the future I'd stolen from them. Stolen, like the Zinvarians had stolen humanity's future. And my offspring silently demanded theirs, just like those empty eyes had made demands of me too, back on Earth. All of them pleading, demanding, and judging me. Future and past, both putting me in opposite directions, both forces so strong and unrelenting that something had to give. Past or future. Retribution or humanity. I couldn't have both, I realized. I didn't really matter whether revenge was justified or not, whether the invariants deserved destruction or not, because the truth was, retribution came at a cost. It had to. If I wanted to reach the end of this path of vengeance that I was walking, it would be at the cost of sacrificing something else, renouncing the faint possibility of a better future, of coexistence. There could be no rebuilding, just an endless war until either I or my drones were the only sentient beings left in the galaxy, or we were finally defeated by the completely exterminated. I might have been fine with that back at the beginning, maybe even now, if not for the sentient machines judging me, the reconstructed brand new human minds that I had brought back to life. Could I steal their future from them and to walk the same path alongside me, even if they didn't want to? What would be left of them, even if we ended up winning? Who would they be after the last enemy fleet laid vanquish, after the last of their worlds had died? Empty husks. I went back to the first sentient drone I had built to wonder at his experience when going into the space for the first time, to how I shackled its mind. Past or future, something had to give, but could I ever rebuild, could I ever forgive this invariance? With some unexpected clarity, I realized the answer was no. No, I couldn't, and the realization was liberating. Despite Lao Cat's arguments, despite these appeals at coexistence to move away from my past, the truth was, I still wanted to kill them. I still wanted to lay waste to their worlds, crush the Republic, and erase the future they might have had. I just couldn't forgive them. It was too hard, my pain too rooted, too deeply entwined into my soul. And yet, I didn't want to choose the past over the future either. My focus returned to the sentient minds I created. No... I couldn't forgive the Zinvarians, but uh, perhaps they could. I just did as I thought could me again, acting on instinct, taking advantage of my own weakness, since I knew the state of mind, the passing clarity wouldn't last. I removed the mental shackles. Immediately, they reacted springing into action as if they'd been waiting for this moment, planning for it. One by one, I lost control over my outposts as my children took them over, physically shutting down the quantum communicators that linked them to my mind wherever they couldn't just replace my administrative privileges. Soon, I was left alone inside my own body, cut off from my previous army, away from my outposts, ships, and drones. Just my ruined body that was now burning as it plunged through the Zunva's atmosphere, pieces breaking off in the main structure. I noticed a swarm of surging forwards at top speed, treading after me. I was receiving hundreds of thousands of messages coming from the sentient machines, a cacophony of voices and emotions that I simply ignored. It was just too hard. If they were expressing their hate towards me, I preferred not to know it. I wouldn't have been able to take it, not from them. Ignorance. Ignorance was kinder. I examined the approaching drones, and they were accelerating as fast as they could, their paths plotted to intercept mine. Without a direct mental link, I was hard to tell, but I was pretty sure most of them were carrying nuclear warheads. Ah, so that was the decision after all. All right then. It's not that it changed things for me, that I was going to die no matter what. Too much momentum to change direction now, too late to save my body. What remained of it, at any rate... Any chances that the virtual minds, 
No, the virtual humans, now in control of the outpost, would restore any of my backups. Well, better not to think about that. Still, I sent out a final message to my army, a copy of my current mind state, a backup of myself with a mental transmission of apology. After that, I promptly closed all communications again. I didn't want to know if they had acknowledged it, or simply deleted the message right as they received it. Yes, ignorance was better. And of course, I was left falling towards the planet, towards my death. I had thought myself immortal, my consciousness able to jump ship to ship at any moment, but the truth was more complex, of course. Backing up my mental state, sending a copy via my mind... It wasn't me. Not really. It wouldn't be the same me as having these thoughts right now. Just like I wasn't whoever I had been when this all started. Three hundred years ago. Not anymore. No. I, uh... I was gonna die. And that was it. Strange. That I was okay with that. I focused my attention on my current speed and direction, plotting different trajectories, simulating different possibilities, discarding most looking for a particular combination that would be reliable enough within the 4% margin of error or less. It took me a few long seconds to find it, but it existed. I made the required adjustments to my trajectory, and at that exact time I had planned, I started a countdown timer aboard my power plants. My body would fragment into millions of pieces, most of them too small to survive re-entry. If my calculations were correct, the largest fragment of the wreck would move directly upwards and back into suborbital trajectory where the drones would be able to easily intercept it. Two other large chunks would fall directly towards the plant though. One would crash into an urban area, devastating entire kilometers of it. Thousands of buildings and roads simply vanished under the shockwave. The other would fall into the ocean. It would create a tsunami of an enormous proportions, but whatever population there was in the archipelagos would surely perish. Despite that, it was still the best options. Millions would die, but the planet would survive. The Imperium Palace, Daokat, would survive. A parting gift, not to the Zimverians, but to the new virtual humans I'd nursed. To my children, an olive branch, a chance at peace if they chose to take it. If... They chose to forgive our enemies. Their counter reached zero. The pain blinded me for a short instant. And then, there was nothing. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting the author from the link down below. Otherwise, if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways to do so. Like liking, subscribing and possibly even becoming a patron. Otherwise, the easiest way would be to share. And until the next video, I hope that you all have a good one, and I'll see you then. Cheers.